Hi, I'm Catherine Wessinger. I'm a professor of religion, religious studies at Loyola University, New Orleans. And I'm very pleased to be here today with Rick Shirley for this interview. And in 1993, Rick Shirley was a police officer and negotiator in Austin, Texas. He and other Austin police officers served as negotiators, working with FBI negotiators during the standoff between federal agents and the Branch Davidians at that their Mount Carmel Center property outside Waco, Texas. Subsequent to the shootout between the Branch Davidians and agents with the Bureau of Tobacco, uh, Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms on February 28, 1993. On February 28th, four ATF agents and six Branch Davidians were killed. FBI agents took over the site on March 1st and named the case um, Wakemore, W-A-C-M-U-R, for Waco murder because four ATF agents had been killed in the shootout. Rick Shirley, thank you for being here and uh, consenting to this interview. Uh, please describe your career as an Austin police officer and the training you received as a hostage negotiator. Thank you. Um, at the time of the standoff, I had been with the Austin Police Department for approximately, um, I guess, eight years and um, just under eight years. And I had been a hostage negotiator or a crisis negotiator for about uh, four of those years. Uh, my training at that time was there uh, an initial 80 hour course that, uh, that we went through that included classroom lecture as well as um, scenario exercises uh, over a period of uh, two weeks. I'd also had some uh, prior uh, training in our education in psychology. Um, I do not did not have a degree in psychology or anything, but I did have uh, some formal education in psychology, um, and I had also been married a number of years at that time, so I had some experience negotiating from that perspective. Okay. But um, also um, after the standoff, of course, I went on and continued uh, my career with the police department. Retired after thirty one years of service with them, and twenty eight of those years I had been a negotiator, including uh, negotiator team leader. So uh, over the, in addition to the 80 hours of training, I'd also had about another, I guess, uh, at least 40 hours of additional in-service training. Um, later on, I went through the, uh, the FBI training, the course, that their certification course, and uh, many, many years of uh, ongoing training every year, uh, usually uh, quarterly, uh, every year in different, uh, either local training or uh, went to different schools throughout the country, so. Great, thank you. Why were the Austin police negotiators asked to join FBI agents negotiating with the Branch of Indians? Well, there were uh, six negotiators for the city of Austin at that time, plus a sergeant. And we often, we, we, uh, I don't, a lot of people don't realize it, but the local law enforcement agencies usually have more negotiated incidents than the federal agents do simply because, you know, the federal agents deal with certain types of, um, of cases where they're called in to negotiate. Um, so we had uh, an experienced team. We had worked closely with Byron Sage. He was assigned to the Austin FBI office as the senior special agent in charge. Um, and we had worked with him on a couple of uh, negotiated situations involving federal buildings. And so he was, and we had also done some training with him and he was confident in our team's ability to to uh, negotiate and we were probably the closest um, major city organized team available that could quick response to the Waco area. I know Waco has some negotiators. I'm not sure what their, their uh, capabilities were at the time, but our level of experience was, was a lot more. Uh, so Byron requested that uh, we we respond to the uh, the incident to assist 
he and the ATF negotiators, and that's what we did. We already had our, they had already called in local SWAT teams from around the area to try to to help out because they could not respond their HRT within that quick a period of time. So we already had some of our SWAT team members on the scene, uh, at least temporarily until the FBI was able to get in and get their team set up. Please describe the situation you observed when you arrived in Waco to serve on the negotiation team. and. As part of this, please describe the transition between the ATF negotiators on February 28th to the FBI and Austin police negotiation team by March 1st. And also please tell us where were you located while you were working as one of the negotiators in this case? Well, we, um, I actually had been reading a news article that morning about the uh, Branch Davidians that in the local paper here in Austin. And that was the first time I'd ever heard of them. Um, and so it was around noontime when I first got a call from my sergeant that I needed to start getting stuff ready. I might be, uh, I would likely be called up pretty quickly. Uh, so we did that. We ended up leaving uh, later on that Sunday night, the 28th, um, to respond to Waco. and. Waco is about an hour and a half to two hours, depending on uh, traffic situation. So we ended up getting there pretty late, around midnight. We were initially directed into the inner perimeter, or I say inner perimeter, it's we're not, not inner perimeter from the standpoint of, of the tactical teams that were there, but up close to where their staging area was. When we got to that location, um, they redirected us, and and I'll ex I'll describe that a little bit since we're there. Uh, it was really everything was really uh, dark. Uh, I think that it had been raining that night, um, and so it was heavy overcast. Pretty much blocked out most of the light. Um, we had passed numerous law enforcement officers as well as news media vans and stuff to get where we were going. And it was just a eerie feeling as we were approaching because everything was just so quiet, so still, even with all that stuff around, just kind of, a, I don't know how to describe it, but when you're in an unusual situation, things have a little different feeling to them. So then we were redirected to the, I believe it's called Texas State uh, Technical College campus then, I'm not sure what it's still called something like that, but they changed the name a little bit. And we were directed there because they have an airstrip there and they had a um, airport management office there where the ATF agent that was doing the negotiating from, from that area, uh, as well as a DPS negotiator were there pretty much by themselves from the standpoint of negotiators. Um, Jim Cavanaugh was the ATF negotiator, and he was using the telephone uh, from that that was there in the office. He was not using any type of special technical equipment or anything. He was using that telephone as well as I think there was a an answering machine with a recording capability, and he was trying to record using that. So once we got there, we saw that they were, uh, they were also surrounded by a number of the ATF agents that had actually the, the members of the team that had been responded that morning and had gotten into the firefight. There were uh, a few of the, those there and they were trying to, to rest up on a, a little open area in that building on mats and stuff to try to get some rest because they've been through a lot. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately though, that created a problem because they were listening to all the negotiations, which can kind of create an emotional roller coaster depending on what, uh, what is being said and, and what all is taking place. So, while Kavanaugh was doing the negotiations, we started setting up uh, 
some special equipment and stuff that we have for being able to include more people in the listening and, uh, of the conversation and also recording the conversation and uh, getting some more reliable equipment set up for him so that if something, you know, something happened, it could be a little bit better controlled with that type of equipment. So that's what we did. And then we filled in all of the different positions that normally make up a negotiator team, especially in a protracted situation, which it kind of looked like that was gonna see what happened. Who could have imagined 51 days? Uh, but as it turned out, that's, that's how long this went on uh, and probably could have gone on a lot longer than that. Uh, so, once we uh, got all the equipment and everything set up and operational, then we started filling in the positions um, on the team. And I think uh, I'll defer back to you and describe a little bit more about how a team is made up later on. Yeah, that's good. Um, uh, yeah, why don't we just go ahead and do that next? So if you could um, please describe how a hostage negotiation team is set up and how it operates. And what are the roles on a negotiation team? Well, depending upon what type of uh, situation you have, uh, something like this would, would necessitate a full operating team, not necessarily every single member of your team that you have in your organization, but a full operating team to fill out, fill in all the positions that are, are needed. Um, in our particular case, and in this particular case, uh, it involved uh, having a team supervisor, having a primary negotiator, which was Kavanaugh, and having a secondary negotiator or a coach. Uh, then you also have a historian or a scribe um, that keeps notes of the ongoing negotiations, uh, documenting uh, significant comments or, or incidents that are taking place. There's also uh, usually someone that is uh, doing the recording because sometimes that takes a little bit uh, away from writing down the notes that you're, that you're taking. Uh, you have a uh, intelligence gathering person, uh, one or more of those. And you also have um, what they call um, uh, status board or um, incident board that is usually some type of whiteboard or chalkboard that you have where the primary negotiator and secondary negotiator can see the information that you're putting down on the board so they can do a quick reference to it to keep their communication going and keep it on track. And there are a whole series of things that you tend to to put on that board to give very specific information to the negotiator. Um, and that's what we did in this particular case. We filled in those different positions and made sure that uh, he was up and running. Uh, and one of the things that a secondary negotiator does or the coach does is they keep a close eye on the primary negotiator to see if they're getting fatigued or what the situation is, or if they've hit a wall where we may need to make a change and put another person in the primary position. Uh, and Kavanaugh had been at it for a while, but he was doing well. And, and uh, at that point in time, he was basically the person that the ranking person in charge of that particular group of negotiation operation until the FBI came in and officially took over the, the operation. And the FBI got there by March 1st? Yes, um, the, one of the advantages of that being located on the airstrip is the air, air, uh, airplanes that were bringing in the FBI teams could land directly on the strip there. So they could bring in all their equipment and, and personnel and, and offload right there, right outside of the, uh, the negotiator operations center. Additionally, they had their command staff and their, what they call a uh, fast start group, which the fast start group is kind of like the historian, except more detailed and more involved. 
Uh, they're doing all the computer entry of all the activities of every team that's there uh, and the instant command group. They're recording everything or, or uh, archiving everything. And in doing so, they are basically archiving into their computer system where anyone that has access to that around the world could see what the current events are, specifically Washington, D.C. in this case. But, um, and then they, uh, they're documenting that live at the time and archiving that live at the time that uh, everything is going on. But they had not, they were not there either that at the time we first started. So that was a gradual process where they were getting set up. And once uh, all of those different personnel started arriving, then we had to move it in, move from where we were to a much larger facility, which was a actually a large aircraft hangar that had uh, executive offices inside of the hangar. And uh, everybody would fit into those offices and the command staff would have a location where they could set up and the negotiator operations center uh, could set up their own private room where th there was not a lot of background noise and stuff. Tactical Operations Center, they had uh, space there. And then, of course, the uh, the fat Rapid Start group took up a, a great deal of space as well. So there was a lot of, there were a lot of, a lot of office space in that hangar, as well as very large aircraft. Um, but that's that's pretty much um, what was taking place from the time we arrived there. The FBI personnel were starting to arrive and continued arriving. When I'm talking about personnel, I'm talking about all their personnel, not not just their negotiators, tactical group, all of that. But they were arriving uh, throughout the night and the next day. Um, Gary Nessner from Quantico arrived. Um, Sometime later that morning, I don't remember the exact time that he got there. I know Byron had uh, Byron and uh, Larry Lynch with the McLennan County Sheriff's Department had been at the McLennan County Sheriff's Department, also negotiating from another location. Byron had been negotiating with uh, some of the folks inside and, and Kavanaugh had been negotiating with them as well from two different locations. So then they combined that. Uh, location there in the, the hangar where they set up the operations entirely. Uh, but sometime during that first night, there was an obvious problem with a lot of the people that were not part of the negotiations uh, that were trying to rest. There was an obvious problem that we were seeing some different emotions and stuff going on as they were listening to to some of the negotiations. And so that was another reason to make that separation. And eventually once they got set up, we did that. And I don't remember whether it was during the nighttime that night, or I think it was the next morning that we made that move. Okay. And I'll just add that it's my understanding that Jim Cavanaugh was negotiating with David Koresh and I was also talking to Steve Schneider up on the second floor of the Branch Davidians residence. And then, uh, then at that time, Lieutenant um, Larry Lynch, uh, he later became sheriff, but Larry Lynch and uh, Byron Sage were talking to initially Wayne Martin, who was an attorney and had an office down on the first floor on the east corner of the building. So yeah. So they were they they were dealing with Wayne Martin quite a bit over at the sheriff's office, but I think they also I think David Koresh was kind of going back and forth uh, between Kavanaugh and and uh, and Byron Sage, but uh, but I think Kavanaugh mostly was speaking with Snyder. Okay, and you mentioned uh, an operations center in the Hoover Building that's called the Strategic Information and Operations Center or SIOC. And so you had FBI officials in that center uh, communicating with FBI 
agents and, and commanders on the ground. So I just, you know, for the people listening to this video, I just wanted to explain what SIOC is. So the FBI agents who were involved in this Branch Davidian case included members of the hostage rescue team, which you've mentioned, the HRT, the negotiators, some FBI negoti negotiators, and a number of special agents in charge from different cities. And special agent in charge Jeffrey Jamar from San Antonio was the on-site commander of the case. And all of these teams and their commanders reported to FBI officials and the FBI Strategic Information and Operations Center in the Hoover Building in Washington, DC. At least that's the impression I got when I read the, um, what, what is known as the, the, the Wakemore Major Event Log. You, I didn't know about this fast start um, procedure to, to send information out uh, to the different, I guess, teams involved in this case. Mm -hmm. Would you happen to know what the fast start was recording um, the different logs? I've read logs from negotiators. I've read logs from HRT. I've read uh, uh, log entries from um, special agents in charge. And I've also read log entries from SIOC, they were all compiled into uh, a major events log, which, which I've read. Most, uh, you know, part of it was redacted, but I've read everything that was visible. Which is what um, they were called Rapid Start. Which is what Rapid Start was doing is they were they were taking all their information from the different logs that were being created, and they would make entry into the major events log. Um, and then they were um, also archiving all of the different uh, documents that were being created uh, otherwise, such as situation reports and that type of stuff. So That's interesting. So, so an official in SIOC, that command center, or that special operations center, and then your special agents in charge could read that, and they could know what's going on with the negotiations, and you know everybody could be on the same page, or at least the the people in charge, the decision makers. Well, they could not read what was going on in real time that the negotiators were communicating back and forth about, uh, but they could pull up archived information as Rapid Start was entering that information in there. Now they could they could at any time enter into the negotiator operations center and monitor what was taking place there. But they also had speakers that went from the negotiator operations center to the, the uh, uh, field command area there, as well as to the uh, tactical operations center. They were able to listen to that as well. And so in the negotiations, if something really, really important was said by David Koresh or one of the other branch of Vidians, was there a way to convey that information to the on-site commander, say Jeffrey Jamar? Yes, they were able to listen. If there was, they were able to listen to the, uh, the conversation live through the external speaker system that were, that was in their office. But additionally, as, as some, some significant comment was made or some significant uh, event took place that was immediately entered into a situation report and forwarded immediately over to them. And then right. that was archived by Rapid Start. All right, thank you. I See, mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about Rapid Start. So thank yeah. you for explaining that. Mm -hmm. um, so once the FBI agents got there, who were the FBI officials who supervised the negotiation team and what were their roles? Um, Gary was actually uh, the person in charge of all of the negotiations. And, um, and that's um, Gary Nestor? That's mm -hmm. correct. And he actually was the person in charge over all of the FBI uh, negotiators full time. Uh, that was his full-time job, and that's why he was based at Quantico. Uh, so when he came to the scene, he was called into the scene to take over uh, command of the negotiations. Um, Byron Sage was also a, of a supervisory rank, so he was, uh, 
he and plus he reported directly to Jeff Jamar as since Jeff Jamar would have been his special agent in charge uh, for the San Antonio regional area. So he reported directly to him. So, uh, but from the negotiator standpoint, uh, Gary would have been in charge of the negotiations. So it's kind of a little bit of a, of a managerial conflict, I guess, from the standpoint in that uh, Jeff Jamar would have been the boss uh, over everything uh, there on in as field commander, um, and then Nosner, Gary, and Gary Nosner and Byron would have been uh, reporting directly to Jamar, um, and then as far as their their involvement with the the negotiator operations center. Um, I think Byron was uh, the team leader for the day shift. And then we had, uh, I was on the night shift. And so we had, uh, I think initially, uh, a gentleman by the name of Dwayne Fuselier was the team leader for the night shift. Um, and so uh, the team leaders would be responsible for reporting to the team supervisor, which would have been Gary. And Gary would have been technically responsible for reporting all actions uh, to Jamar. But if Gary didn't happen to be there, then the team leader would handle that, that function, whoever, whichever shift team leader was, was on duty. But since there was a special relationship between Byron and Jeff Jamar, there was also that dependency on Jeff by Jeff Jamar on uh, um, trying to get information directly from Byron. So that was the, that was a fairly minor conflict there, but that's just another, another conflict that probably was a little bit of a headache for Gary. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, so Gary Nestor as the uh, negotiation coordinator uh, he was rotated out. He was taken off the case. I think he was removed by February 24th, uh, if I remember correctly. Maybe you not February, March. 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 I meant March. He yeah. was he was taken out by March 24th. Um, uh, so who became the FBI negotiation coordinator after he was removed? They brought in Fred Lansley uh, to take over Gary's position. Um, and that went on for, uh, I forget how long Fred was there, but there was a, there was a little bit of a conflict that between Gary's recommendations and, uh, the HRT team leader, as well as Jamar. Mm -hmm. So, and the conflict basically was a growing conflict because every time we as the negotiators would accomplish something positive, then there would be some type of tactical operation or tactical event that they would do something that was negative. Just nearly every time that we did something positive, they would do something that created a, a negative uh, appearance um, that really kind of went against what we were trying to do. Uh, and that was something that, I mean, it wasn't every single time that we had a conversation with anybody inside, but if we got somebody released, um, then it wasn't long before something was done that really kind of took away from the positive aspect of, of those releases. So well, that's, it, was, yeah. it was pretty frustrating. I'm sure. So, yeah, I, as somebody who's read the log or the major event log, um, you know, it appears to me that the, the FBI or first Jim Cavanaugh, he was, he and um, uh, Lieutenant Larry Lynch, they worked very hard to get this, get more children sent out, you know, while they were right. doing the negotiating. And uh, once, um, you know, Gary Nessner came in is, uh, supervisor, negotiation supervisor, some more children, as I recall, were sent out. But, uh, and then there were some successes getting adults to come out. But um, 
so it appears to me from the log that whenever adults came out, that's when the hostage rescue team took some sort of punishing action, like um, turning first turning the electricity off, or then um, uh, eventually they started blasting high decibel sounds uh, at the Branch Davidians. Um, well, it, it it usually wasn't an instantaneous thing. It's usually uh, the one of the things I forgot to mention is the FBI had behavioral scientists that were on scene there as well. And the DOJ had AUSAs, their assistant US attorneys. Um, so those were additional people that were arriving on scene. But the whenever those types of things were done, um, there was usually some type of involvement by the behavioral scientists making recommendations for or against. Uh, but when the decisions were made where those things were were done, such as turning off the electricity, et cetera. It usually was as a result of, of something that they, that the Branch Davidians had decided they were either were not gonna talk to us anymore, they weren't gonna answer the phone, or they were refusing to, um, to provide or move in the direction that, that they were wanting them to move. And so then that they would make the decision to, to take the action that they took. But usually it wasn't unusual for some of those actions to take place, I guess, when we were feeling there was some positive movement there. Uh, for example, and, and not so much the electricity, that was kind of a, uh, an incentive to try to get them to get back on the phone with us and, and communicate with us. Uh, and that was something that was run by us, but the behavioral scientists had a lot of input on that along with uh, the tactical operations team. But um, more of the things that were, they were kind of nitpicky things that they would do um, they would decide at the time that we were getting some, making some progress to go in and move some vehicles around that they found to be obstructing their, their capability to, to take tactical action that they needed to. And so they would send tanks up to grab vehicles and either push them out of the way or whatever they did with them. In some cases, I think they ran over them, but, um, you know, it's, the timing was just really terrible. Uh, I, I don't know that I can argue one way or the other about their their strategy behind moving those those vehicles and stuff around to open up their their egress and ingress avenues. But the timing that they did those things was the problem was creating the problem. Uh, Jamar even came in and asked us. I, I think Koresh had a favorite vehicle. It was parked there in front of the door. And Jamar even came in and asked us our opinion on uh, what would happen if they went in and, and basically yanked that vehicle out of there and, and did some damage to it in the progress and in the process. And he went, he asked for people's input. Very few people would provide that input, but I wasn't working for him. Uh, he didn't pay my salary. So uh, I said, uh, to be honest with you, I think that it would, it would possibly create a, uh, a uh, violent response from them if you did that. And he got mad about that and wanted to remove me from the team. But they finally, I think Byron finally got him calmed down and they decided that was not the case. And so they kept me on, but um, that was an example of being honest with him. And that was an honest perspective. If he didn't like it, then he blew up. And uh, including one time that he came walking into the negotiator operations center, slamming his hand, his fist into his hand saying, um, I don't want any more adults out of there until we get more children. Well, that's totally contradictory of what we want to do. I understand his concerns. I understand his emotions, but 
there's no need to say something like that, nor is there any desire or effort on our part to do that. Uh, we want to get people out of their period. Do we want to get children out of there, uh, especially? Yes, um, for many different reasons, for the children's safety, but also to uh, hopefully encourage the adults to come out to their children. So there's a, a two-pronged reason for getting children out of there. Uh, the main one is their safety, and the, the secondary one is hopefully it will inspire adults to come out. Um, in some cases, it did, but not in every single case. And at some point in time, we got to the point where the remaining children, now I know there were some young teenage age uh, youths that were in there that never came out. But at some point in time, uh, we got to the point where the only children that were still in there were supposedly his biological children. And based on the religious beliefs and his uh, perspective on things, those were probably never going to come out. But yeah, Again, there were some there were some other children in there, but yeah, you're right. And most the majority of them were his biological children, right. for sure. Right. Yeah. So that's that's uh that's when it started slowing down a lot as far as getting any of the children out as as we got closer to um to his biological children. And then um, I'm sure there were some adults whose whose children they did not, especially the the little older ones uh, that they did not let them come out because they didn't come out either. So, um, but I don't know. I don't know a lot of the reasons why uh, those decisions were made by the parents of the children, but, you know, certainly it was from a religious perspective, at least that's, you know, you can never know fully what's in a person's mind unless you are that person, but that would make the most sense. Right. Uh, well, you share some things about uh, Jeffrey Jamar and coming in to talk to the negotiators and when you gave him your honest uh, professional judgment about he shouldn't move um, or crush um, or have David Koresh's car crush, which I think was a Camaro. Um, and they eventually did move that car toward the end. Um, right. They got, but, um, were there other times when Jeffrey Jamar came in to talk to the negotiators that you recall and things that he said? Yeah, he, I mean, usually there were, there were times he would come in speaking fairly calmly with us and getting information from us and stuff. Um, and then there were other times he would be angry and he would come in and demanding that we do this or we do that. Uh, one of the problems was the issue of, of Easter approaching and uh, he was pretty upset that this was going on. He said, this is not gonna be going on forever and uh, we want to get everybody out of there before Easter gets here. Uh, and that was, we did too. I mean, <laughs> there was not any, not any disagreement there. We wanted to get everybody out of there right away, but uh, he was pretty upset about that and kind of demanding and slamming his fist again into his hand. So. Um, and then it's at different times, there were different things that were coming through behavioral scientists. I think there was a recommendation at one point in time that, that, uh, based on the legal aspects of things, we'll just build a, a wall around the whole compound and, and, uh, put a, a minimal staff on that to monitor people trying to come out of there, I say a wall, I mean, a large a high fence, I guess is what they were talking about. Build that and then just uh, have a minimal staffing there and send everybody else home. So um, there was a lot of different uh, things thrown out there during the 51 days that were going on that some of it we were aware of and some of it we were not made aware of. But that was one of the, and I think that even ended up in the one of the news through some of the news reports that came out. But, um, so you, you can see the frustration. There was a lot of different things that are being thrown around there about uh, what could we do and 
And because a lot of people looked at this as being a, a hostage situation per se, but there's, you, you might look at this as not so much being a hostage situation because you had willing people that were willing, that were staying inside by, by choice. At least that was the impression at times that we got. Of course, we didn't know all of the people that were in there. We found out some of the people that were in there. We found that out later on after the, the fire. Mm -hmm. But they were, the entire time we were there, they were trying to gather intelligence and getting phone calls from all over the world of people asking about their family members. If, if their family, if they knew their family member was there or if they had not seen their family member in a long time and thought they might be there, they were trying to find that out. So, um, the FBI and in some cases us, but uh, the negotiators, we were getting information from all over the world about things like that and trying to find out who was inside there and who wasn't inside there. And we identified quite a few people that were in there, some of which we talked to and some we talked to them for exactly that reason to uh, confirm they were there and let their family members know that they were there. But um, there were quite a few people that through all the intelligence gathering and the communications and all that, that we never heard a peep out of them and never knew they were even inside there until too late. So. Uh, if we could go back to the negotiation uh, coordinator after um, Gary Nestor left. So Fred Lansley came in, but at, at some point, Another man came in from the FBI, uh, Clint Van Zant. So, yeah, he. About how uh, was that transition? Similar to Gary's, um, Fred had also taken basically the same position that Gary had taken after Fred had been there for a while. And I think Fred had also been involved in the negotiations at the Ruby Ridge standoff. So there was already a little bit of conflict between the the uh, HRT commander and, and Fred, at least that's my understanding. Uh, and so uh, at some point in time, I don't remember how long Fred was there, but they decided to ship him out too. And they brought in, uh, brought in, uh, the name just slipped my mind. Who, that's what okay, it's, uh, it's Clint Van Zandt. But Clint I'll, Van Zandt, you've, yes. You've mentioned the uh, HRT commander, so I'll just say that his name was Dick Rogers. Yes, and so, I, I actually never met him, I don't think, the okay. entire time that that I was there. I don't think I ever met him. He was, he didn't spend much time around negotiators. So. And so uh, what was it like when Clint Van Zandt came in? Um, the transition from one supervisor to the next or coordinator to the next was fairly smooth. There wasn't any conflict from the negotiators because um, the coordinators had, had basically a great deal of experience. And so there wasn't any real concern there. I mean, we were, we were often surprised that one or the other was being shipped out of there and we're a little concerned about why, but we knew why. Uh, they were not in agreement with some of the things that were taking place there and they, they were trying very hard to stay as close to standard negotiator practices and principles as possible. And the flip side of that coin was going against us quite often. So uh, the the tactical aspect as well as the, the leadership aspect. So that's why those, that is what we were told was the reason why those conflicts arose and why those changes kept being made. Uh, so that concerns you a little bit as a negotiator that you're sitting there seeing that the conflicts are so significant that they're moving people out. Yeah, so basically, um, Gary Nessner and Fred Lansley wanted to implement the good negotiation protocols that 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 your team and the FBI all know about and can implement. And and so whenever you had successes, the hostage rescue team would take some kind of tactical action to 
right. undermine the trust that had been built up. Right. Okay. And they did. Uh, there was. Uh, we didn't really believe it at the time. We thought they were that the Branch Davidians were pulling our legs. But you know, one time they said that you know they're they're pretty upset because one of the tactical team members uh, had mooned them. Uh, there was another time where they were flipping them off with with uh, the the middle finger, uh, and so we were a little bit um, doubtful of that and because that would be very unprofessional and out, and should should have been out of character for that level of professionalism for any not even that level but any level of professionalism in the law enforcement that should not have been taking place uh, after the fact after this was all over with I later spoke to one of the team members, the age, the uh, tactical team members, and he said yes, that it had that it had happened. So that wasn't I wasn't real impressed with that. As a matter of fact, I was pretty angry about it because that there's no place for that, first of all. And secondly, it does a lot of damage to our efforts. So it shouldn't have happened, period. Uh, do you want to express yourself a little bit more on that before I go on to my next question? Because this is an important point that you're you're making here. Do you have anything else? Any other comments you want to make? No, I think that pretty much clarifies my position on it. There's no, you know, I, I was in law enforcement for, like I said, for um, 33 years, counting the two years I volunteered. Um, I was in law enforcement for 33 years in criminal law enforcement and in administrative law enforcement for 10 years before that. And there's a level of uh, expected professionalism. I mean, behind the scenes, when you're just just amongst your your coworkers, and there's a lot of humor and a lot of joking back and forth amongst themselves, just like any any organization. Um, and some of it in law enforcement gets a little bit morbid because sometimes you, the way you deal with things, uh, you have to have a little bit of a morbid sense of humor or you'll go crazy because some of the things that you see and some of the things that you deal with. Um, but when you're dealing with the public or when you're in, especially when you're dealing with a situation like this, where you are in a standoff situation, there's no room for that at all. It doesn't matter what the person or people that you're dealing with are doing to you. You don't, you don't lose your professionalism and do things like that. And at the level of professionals that we're talking about here, that shouldn't even have been a, have been a question. Yet it was. And not only does that make you angry looking back on it, um, but it's extremely disappointing. Uh, that that your your members of your profession would do something like that. Okay, thank you. Um, during the negotiations, did you speak directly with Branch Davidians, and if you did, what did they have to say? I spoke with with a, a very few. Most of my responsibilities were um, as the historian slash recorder. Um, and also the continuous brainstorming that we would do in between calls. But uh, I spoke to, uh, I believe his name was Henry Phillips. Um, and a couple of others, I don't remember the names, but the communication that I had with them was, with any of them was fairly uh, insignificant in the big picture of things. And, uh, I didn't have communications with with anyone for a great length of time. Uh, I did speak to Steve Snyder just brief, briefly because he, they did not believe that we were actually Austin police officers there doing negotiations. They didn't understand that at all. They, you know, they knew that the FBI had a team and that the FBI was in, in charge of it and they would, didn't understand why 
Austin police officers, and for that matter, why not Waco police officers, you know, mm -hmm. since they were right there, but they didn't understand why we were there. So they thought it was some type of deception when we were explained to them that we were Austin police officers, but we were, and it was. Okay. All right. Uh, next, I want to ask you about an episode that occurred on March 1st and March 2nd, but I'm going to describe it a little bit, then I'll okay. have my question for you. So on March 1st, uh, David Koresh said that if an audio tape, which he would record giving his theological understanding of the situation, was played on national television, he and his followers would come out. The audio tape was sent out with two older Branch Davidian women who came out on March 2nd at 7.58 a.m. And by 1.30 p.m., it was played on the Christian Broadcasting Network and the and KRLD radio out of Dallas. Koresh's agreement with, an, with the FBI was that after the audio tape was aired nationally, he, and he was wounded, but he would be carried out on a stretcher by some of the Branch Davidian men. And then the other Branch Davidians would come out in small groups. However, Koresh and the Branch Davidians did not come out on March 2nd at 4 p.m. as Koresh had promised. The FBI's major event log records that Koresh was experiencing a lot of pain as he was put on a stretcher and men started carrying him downstairs. He was on the second floor. At 5.58 p.m., Steve Schneider, who was Koresh's right-hand man, told a negotiator that Koresh had prayed and had been told by God to wait. So how did Special Agent in Charge Jeffrey Jamar and other FBI agents react? to Koresh's failure to come out on March 2nd? Well, the best way to describe it is like having a very large balloon and you punch a needle in the side of it and all everything just comes out and it totally deflates the balloon. That's the way everybody pretty much felt. And then the anger set in. Um, and, and I don't I don't think there's any better way to describe it to, than to say that everybody was angry and upset that he he lied about it. Uh, I mean, everybody felt really good that they were going to get everybody out and that everybody was going to be safe and that this thing was going to be over. And then, you know, everybody could go and do whatever they were going to be doing. Um, and so. I think everybody was just totally, they they totally fell into the belief that this was going to take place and then it didn't. So you can imagine the frustration, the anger, uh, the distrust. I think that set the tone for distrust of what Koresh would promise from then on. Um, and so you, you'll get, you will, will get into some things as we go along about some of the other things that that uh, Koresh said he was going to do. But I think that particular event did more to create a la lacking distrust of, of him following through on any of the promises that he was making. So it was very significant. Okay. And then right after that, the tanks were brought in to surround the the property um if you say so i don't <laughs> yeah I, we were not really privy to all of the things that were going on outside of the the uh, ranch davidian we called it a compound but yeah i think they referred to it as a house um, yeah, yeah that's yeah it was right after that the tanks came in so yeah. um so was there something else you wanted to say? I, don't, I think, I don't, I don't know the exact timing on everything, but I think that's when you started seeing some more of the things like the uh, the electricity cut off and starting to deprive, attempting to deprive them of some of the conveniences that they had. Um, when I say attempting, because they actually had a pretty good plan of how they would maintain their living environment in a standoff like that. So they were 
pretty well prepared for a lot of things. Had a lot of, they said they had no food inside, but we knew from listening devices and all that, that they had lots of food available to, to maintain for at least some period of time. They had water storage that they had access to. They had fuel storage that they had access to. Um, and I don't know whether they had generators or not, but it wouldn't surprise me that they had generators in there since they had fuel storage uh, access as well. But yeah. I, don't, I don't remember anything coming up about generators. I know uh, there's bound to have been some type of generator that Koresh had access to for his, his area because they had power to some of the, the uh, machinery that they had there even after they cut off the electricity to the building itself. Yeah, they had a lot of food, but the, the, during the ATF raid, um, the, wa the water tanks outside the building were shot up, and so a lot of water was lost. So they had, right. a, they had a limited amount of water, but they had water for a while. Yeah. Right. So were the ATF agents, excuse me, were the FBI agents and negotiators aware that David Koresh was teaching his followers that he and many of the followers would be killed by government agents and then later resurrected as part of the end time events. He was teaching an apocalyptic theology of martyrdom. Did the negotiators and FBI agents know about David Koresh's apocalyptic theology of martyrdom? And if they, if they did, what were the sources for that information? There were uh, several ex-Branch Davidians, uh, or they may have still actually been Davidians or Branch Davidians, but they were not, they were no longer uh, residents of the, of the building there. They had either left on their own or been told to leave. Um, and several of those, I think you're familiar with Mark Bro. He was one of the main sources. Um, of information initially on that, but there were a number of other, um, some of the children that had been in there before, but were older now, uh, and their, their parents who had come out as well uh, before any of this took place. So they were constantly gathering information from those sources and running that by them, as well as uh, communicating with uh, at least my understanding was they were communicating with different theologians and getting their advice as well as the behavioral scientists. But um, there was discussion about that. There was also discussion about uh, suicide by fire. Um, there was, and you, if you've gone through any of the recordings and logs, you know that we often would touch on uh, suicide and whether you're planning to harm yourselves or others, that type of thing. Um, but there was, uh, there was some discussion about the uh, apocalyptic aspect of it and uh, whether or not there was going to be an attempt at martyr, martyrdom. Um, and I, I think that, that those were always considerations and always thought of, but when you're dealing with negotiations, you, you use that information to explore gathering intelligence as to confirming whether or not that is in the plans or not. Um, but you still use your same negotiator principles and tactics that you would use regardless of what the circumstances are. And that is to continue the conversation and get them to discuss more things with you um, of their own accord, more so than you trying to lead them in a particular direction. But is there some of that that you're trying to very clearly pinpoint and, and, and um, really lock them into what their plans are or what their capabilities are. Yes, that's, that's all part of it because as a negotiator, you're trying to 
get people to come out peacefully of their own accord and trying to work through things with them, but you're also gathering intelligence at that throughout the entire time. So yes, that, that was a consideration. Where that came from was, was people that had previously been inside and had been part of the group and uh, were recipients of Koresh's teachings. So if the negotiators were aware of the theology that David Koresh was teaching in a general way, then probably Jeff, Jeffrey Jamar would have been aware of it, I would assume. He, he, he probably would have been aware of it before we were, mm -hmm. uh, because that information was gained through uh, agents who were assigned to gather intelligence and interview uh, all these different people reporting directly to him with their situation reports and their, their report of findings of those interviews. So... Uh, and that was, to my understanding, that was something that was ongoing throughout. I mean, every time somebody would come out, uh, whether it was an adult or a child, there would be someone assigned to sit there and uh, sit there and interview them and talk to them to find out a little bit about what was going on. The children, some of the children that we got out early on actually were brought into the negotiator area so that the negotiators could could talk to them a little bit and make sure that they were handling things okay. And because they, you know, I think that we had a many ways had a better understanding of how to talk with kids as well as adults to help them calm them down and stuff before they went off to where they took them. But uh, we would, we would talk to everybody that, I say we, the FBI would talk to every single person that came out yeah. and get as much information from them as they could. 